jiu-jitsu is a game of trying to force your opponent to tap through strangulation or joint manipulation that that's what it really is but it's really just like a, a gigantic problem that you have to keep solving it's like a fun rubik's cube that changes its colors all the time there, there's no fundamental techniques there's fundamental positions there's fundamental concepts that don't change but there are no fundamental techniques and there's no one technique or many techniques that you have to learn to be good at jiu-jitsu like most brazilian champions that i know started when they're about six years old and they were training with other world champions all the way till now they're 35 years old and they're like i'm you know five-time black belt world champion listen to me i know what i'm talking about it's like yeah you you spent literally 20 to 30 times longer to do what i did one of the bigger differences between me and most people is i tried something and then i learned from it where most people learn something and then they try it and it's quite different and i want to lead by example with like actually saying what we feel and what we think and uh, i know i'm not a racist person i'm not a sexist i'm not anything like that you know uh, people can sit there and label because i say i don't like woke shit and they're like yeah he's fucking whatever it is i don't care <laughs> the doctor's like bro he goes did you walk in here and i'm like yeah why he's like you've he goes your knees fucked he goes your <laughs> ACL, you've torn your mcl your pcl your lcl and you've completely split the lateral meniscus Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel for our weekly content. Today's guest is uh, an actor and a director. He is a problem-solving genius in jiu-jitsu, uh, a man who achieved his Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt in under four years, Kit Dale. Kit, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? I'm good, mate. You as well? Yeah, very well, thank you. Mate, thanks, uh, thanks for coming on. It's great to meet you. I've been following your content, uh, both your jiu-jitsu content and your acting for many years, so it's, uh, it's nice to... Uh, to have a conversation with you <laughs> yeah i was laughing at some of your uh, reels yesterday mate <laughs> <laughs> got me so i think i think we can appreciate the uh, the australian humor quite well i think you're based in la at the moment though aren't you yeah yeah i moved to la uh, i think to 2018 yeah okay how do you find the humor out there oh um, it took it took a while for me to even understand what i was saying uh but a lot of what i say goes over their head a lot of what i use is like dry humor um yeah and uh yeah it's it's lost on them a lot of the time but i think they're starting <laughs> to understand me. i think a lot of time they just laugh because they think i'm saying something funny and uh or they expect it to be something funny but i, I don't think i have a clue what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> mate it's the same with us and it? it's yeah. like it, english australian humor is really similar and we're sarcastic fuckers <laughs> mm-hmm yeah i love it um mate so just to give you an idea of our situation so we're both uh sort of fans of jiu-jitsu i've been training on and off for many years like close to, to probably 17 years but i've been in and out a fair bit i'm still a purple belt uh danny's about 18 months in um still uh, a two-stripe white belt <laughs> although on, on paper but in reality i'm sure he's very close to his, his blue belt um but obviously you were renowned for getting a black belt very quickly um i think it was just inside four years right mm -hmm. so we're you know, obviously we're lacking a little bit. We're lagging a little bit here, I think, in regard to our progression. So we're doing something wrong. So we're really interested to hear about how you got your black belt so quickly. Well, yeah, yeah. So the first thing I did that was very different to what most people were doing was I didn't really listen to a coach. Um, it's not that I didn't trust them. I, I just, for me, the fun in jiu-jitsu was about solving the problems myself. And I, and I feel like uh, the ability to do that <laughs> – brought me great joy so i would uh i was focusing more on just coming in and i just wanted to roll with people and just practice things and um so i stopped turning up to the technique portion of training like quite early and if i had to do the technique stuff it was more like i would try and figure out why they were doing things rather than how they were doing things and every time i would do it I would try and do it a little bit different i try and find a different way to you know, to accomplish every single step and, uh, and I never thought this was going to make me any, you know, better than anyone else at, a, at any different speed. I just, that was the way I enjoyed jujitsu. But what I found was I was progressing far faster than everybody else. And this is more than people that were training twice as much as me, plus doing the technique side of things. So we kind of realized uh, early, me and a friend of mine who was an entrepreneur, because he was kind of like looking at me like a test subject, <laughs> like a lab rat, <laughs> trying to figure out why is Kit progressing faster than everybody else? And then he was kind of uncovering a lot of the uh, science behind learning. 
So it wasn't really me, and 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 I, I just don't have the temperament to to study a lot of that kind of stuff. Doesn't I don't find it that interesting to be honest with you. It was, it's interesting, but it's not like something I would study compared to like someone like Greg uh, Sowers that like spend, you know, he he understands the science better than anyone I know. Um, but for me, it was more just through my own experience. So I started progressing a little faster and, and then it was more like, okay, after I got my black belt and, and it wasn't just that I got my black belt and I was trying to get a black belt. I was like, I just wanted to compete against the best people in the world. And I wanted to test myself against the best people in the world. And, and that's, you know, the, the belts just came along with that. So uh, after, by the time I got my black belt, I started trying to figure out, okay, why the fuck did I like progress so much faster than everybody else? And, um, how can I, uh, use that? to you know and create i don't like to say a system or anything but like a uh, a training style so people can accomplish the same thing and it wasn't just as simple as as you know don't drill techniques and stuff and, and just roll because there was a lot of things that i was doing when rolling that uh were very important for progression and uh a couple little things is i don't like i don't like losing anything that i'm passionate about i don't like um I don't like getting beaten in any way, shape, or form without trying to figure out a solution for it. If I don't, I feel like uh, I just don't feel very comfortable. So anytime anything happens, and look, as, as a white belt, so many things happen. So it's like you just pick and choose like uh, something to fix. But I, I try not to let anything happen to me that I don't then find a solution for. And uh, I, and I think progression in any kind of art or you know sport or, or industry is about making a lot of mistakes and they're all making every single mistake you can possibly and then fixing them and having solutions for them so you don't make them anymore and you make different mistakes. And uh, what I did really well with jiu-jitsu is I, I allowed myself to make a lot of mistakes. I took a lot of risks and uh, and I tried to repair my own mistakes. And, and through doing that, it's, you're using a system of trial and error with problem solving and, and basically you start getting more and more experience. So I kind of took like jiu-jitsu as if it was a – as if I was starting my own business startup compared to what everyone else tended to do where they went to business school and learned how to run a business. Uh, so the one of the bigger differences between me and most people is I tried something and then I learned from it, where most people learn something and then they try it. And it's quite different. It really gains a very different uh, result because – when you try something and you learn from it, everything that, you know, all that information you get makes so much sense because it's come from your own experience and you've systematically, you know, used trial and error to get to that solution where when someone tells you something, they're giving you usually the tip of the iceberg, all the all the stuff that they did to figure out this technique, they can't give you. That's all the experience. Just It's, it's not translatable. Uh, but what they can do is they can give you the solution. And for certain industries, I can see why that might be uh, more beneficial than jujitsu. Like if you were a heart surgeon or something, you probably don't want to go out and just you know, <laughs> trial and error on everything. <laughs> Try this out today, you know, see what happens. Oopsies. Um, but for jujitsu, I think it's perfect uh, for learning. Um, so those were some of like simple things that I, that I did and, and we could, you know, spend 10 hours going through the science of, of, of certain things and why, why it works. But they, they were the bigger differences that I had compared to what most people had or the way most people trained in, in jiu-jitsu. And I continue to do it to this day with everything I learned. And, and maybe because I'm a little bit ADD as well, where I just don't want to, like, I just don't, I don't want to listen to people. I just want to go and do it. Like, I get very, like, when I used to work years ago and uh, my boss would say, kid, I need you to go get some. I'd already be walking off before I even knew what I was going to get. And he'd be like, kid, I haven't even told you what to get. And I'm like, oh, yeah, what do you want? You know, it's just like, it's kind of awesome. <laughs> I just want to get into it, but you know, it definitely means I have. Uh, it's kind of like counterintuitive. It means I have a lot more work myself to do, um, but that work really, really pays off. You know, I, I I write scripts at the moment, and and I will be for a, for a long time. And uh, I have a, a mentor. His name's Sheldon Turner. He's a Golden Globe winning uh, writer. He's an Oscar-nominated writer. He wrote The Longest Yard, X-Men First Class, Up in the Air. He's done rewrites in probably most movies you've seen. And um, the way he was telling me to write was the way he writes is he writes an outline before he writes a, a, a script. And an outline is basically you kind of break down scene by scene what happens. So it's like a skeleton for a, for a script. 
and a script is a skeleton for a movie. And uh, the way I kind of write is very different to most people where I just get in, I just start writing. Uh, I don't write an outline or anything. I don't know where I'm going most of the time. Um, but what happens is every word inspires a new word and every sentence a new sentence and then um, then eventually I get somewhere. And if I get through, to, you know, if I get to the end of a movie and it makes sense or a script and makes sense, <laughs> Then I'm like, okay, well, if this has got potential, let's come back in and let's start decorating it because it'll usually be a bit of shit, uh, and then I got to fix it, fix it right up. <laughs> but you know, something he told me, and, and it's true too. He said, look, by doing an outline, you're going to save yourself so much writing time. But then when I said to that, I said, that's true, but I'm also going to rob myself of so much learning time. So for me, the way I write a script is probably going to take a lot longer. Let's say it's going to take five times longer than what someone would if they were doing an outline because I would have to do so many more drafts. But I'm going to learn 15 times more than what they're going to learn by the time we finish. So it's kind of like a backwards way of looking at things, but you know, it's going to take me longer to come up with a solution in jiu-jitsu, especially when I was younger, than what it would be if I turned on a Gordon Ryan DVD or something. But things that I'm going to get coming up to that solution are going to be far more valuable and something I cannot get through any kind of DVD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds, uh, sounds, yeah, sounds fascinating, mate. And we'll definitely dig into some of the science of learning in a bit because, um, yeah, I, I geek out about that sort of shit, but in regard to, to that analogy, that's a really good one. Um, but I, I'm sort of thinking about how people listening to this podcast can maybe apply that style of training. And before we get into it, we should probably add some context as well, because you weren't training like 10 hours a day, were you? I think you had a full-time uh, job as well. Yeah, yeah, I had a full-time job. I think I was working in a factory for most of it. Uh, I was also playing Australian rules football. So I was, okay. uh, I was usually training football Tuesday and Thursday night, and then Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I was doing jiu-jitsu, and sometimes a Saturday. Uh, and then when the football season was on Saturday, I would do football on Saturday. So, because we'd have like a preseason for football and, uh, where we were trained for probably, I don't know, I can't remember, like four or five months before we even played. And then, uh, and then when we played, we'd play on Saturday. So I'd kind of go back and forth between doing jujitsu on Saturday and, and football on Saturday. And, and I was getting paid to play football too. So it, like that, that took preference for, for a while. And then it was kind of towards, the end where I was like, you know what, I think I might start this jiu-jitsu thing and, and then I went more into jiu-jitsu and then I went back into football and then I hurt my knee and then I didn't do both for a while and then come back. I've had a lot of time off. Like I don't I don't train like, a, you know, and even when I was competing in the world championships later on, like I, I really like I, I trained quite well when I was my, uh, like first year of black belt, I trained pretty hard. And then after that, I, I trained more like a hobbyist. Uh, mm -hmm. I progressed really fast. I just didn't really care that much about competing. And, and then the results are never going to be as good because I'm going against people that I'm better than, but I, I only have like four minutes of gas compared to them. Because, <laughs> you know, and, and it's not that like, you know, I wasn't inefficient, but at that level, it's, it's very hard. And, and you get someone like a Mateus Deniz that has like an unbelievable gas tank and it gets to the, the nine minute mark. It doesn't matter how much you're up by, your, your body starts getting exhausted and they feel it and they know and they push, they keep pushing it up and then, you know, you end up losing. You know? So there's a lot of like, I should have done a lot better at, at black belt level than what I, uh, what I did or what my skill level allows, but it was also like a matter of interest and it just wasn't that interesting to me. Yeah, no, fair enough. So how many hours were you, were you training then when you, were, when you said you were juggling the, the sort of factory work and the Aussie rules football? So yep. during that period, roughly how many hours were you training per week? About an, uh, one, two, three, average to three or four hours. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's fucking insane. Yeah, that's, that's nuts. That's insane, mate, isn't it? Okay, well, that gives me, that gives me hope because that, that's about as much as I typically train these days. So Yeah, it's, it's not so much like the time on the map that's important. It's the time spent, you know, trying to figure out you know, fix the things that happen on the mat. Uh, even when I was on the mat, like I didn't train that much on the mat. Like let's say it was an hour. I probably trained 35 minutes on there because I would like, I would do a round with someone and then I would sit out around and I would sit there thinking about it and just talking shit and it was, and then I'd get back into it and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so, th but it was mostly of what I was doing was thinking about what happened in jiu-jitsu. So, I would go to jiu-jitsu do everything and then i would leave and i'd be in the car and i'd be thinking this dude on the plot of me today what did he, he did this and that so if he does this next time i'm going to try and do this and see if i can yeah, see if this helps and i'll be trying to figure things out while i was in the car or driving or something it was a long way to you know when i used to train i used to tr i think it was like an hour and a half away i, I had to 
to drive or I had to get a train and it was a pain in the ass. Um, but I would always be thinking about it. Like <laughs> anytime someone takes me down, someone submits me or something, like, it's in my head until I can come up with a solution. Like I just don't let it out. Yeah. Okay. That's 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 interesting. I do that as well. Yeah. Even Friday night after training, I was like fucking in my head, like how the fuck do I get him off me? <laughs> yeah, but I think that that's the I guess at the pleasure of time there wasn't as you say as much as that commute was a pain in the ass. It sounds like having that time to reflect was, was amazing for how your brain works, mm -hmm. and potentially I guess your day job in a factory. I, I can't imagine that was too taxing mentally. Perhaps I don't know, but that's quite repetitive. Yeah, so you could probably sit there pondering during that period as well, which has helped. Going back to your analogy about the writing, um, I mean, it feels like for a lot of people, they, they could take that approach, but they it's almost like they don't even understand English. So they couldn't even write a skeleton because their, their, their jiu-jitsu knowledge is so limited, they probably couldn't even understand in some cases what's just happened to them. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts with that? How did you handle that in the very early days of starting jiu-jitsu? Well, I'll tell you one thing. And we use writing as an analogy. When I started writing, I didn't know where to put the commas. I didn't even use a period. I would put a, an exclamation mark on everything. I did everything upper, upper case lettering because I didn't know what should be and what shouldn't. So when I started writing, I started in probably <laughs> the worst place you could imaginable. Um, I, would love to, I would love to show you a, uh, like a, a scene out of my first script. You'll laugh. It was the most <laughs> cheesy shit world it was so dumb uh so I, I definitely did start in the worst place possible when it comes to that and and i think that with with jujitsu it, it is uh, it can be very overwhelming because there are so many different variables and you're getting kind of the way i'm saying you're getting thrown in the deep end and it can be uh, very frustrating and and so many things going wrong that it's going to be very hard to even figure out okay which one do i even uh what problem do I fix? I had a thousand and I didn't know. You know. So what I try and do now, and, and and this is something that I did naturally anyway, I try and get people to focus on small areas of the game and uh, and really fix those those parts of the game. So when I was rolling, what I would do a lot is I would keep revisiting the same position. Like I would be like, okay, this month I'm I'm working on like my butterfly guard. My butterfly guard sucks. So I would just force butterfly guard with every single person I rolled with. And I was very disciplined. Like if I swept them, then I would just let them sweep me back without them knowing I'm letting it do it. But I would go back in that position. And I would keep and I was just getting more and more experience and to a point where I felt like, okay, butterfly guard now is my strongest part. I'm going to go and start working half guard. I'm going to start working this. Uh, so I was very disciplined when I was rolling. And a lot of people don't have that or that ability to control the the, the rolling positions. So if you don't, what I, what I do and the way I teach now is I create small games. So to limit the amount of variables in jiu-jitsu, which are you know, phenomenally high, what I try and do is I create a smaller game with less variables and a very specific objective. So let's say it, it may be we're starting from an underhook from half guard and my goal is just to get the back from there and your goal is just to stop me from getting the back or defend. And we're just little things like that. And I can make it even smaller. I can get it to like the dogfight position where I have an underhook. I'm already on my knees. You've got an overhook and I'm trying to take your back and you're trying to put me back on my back. You know, just little things and we just keep going over it and over it and over it and over it and you start figuring out these little things. So let's say I have someone brand new that that has never done jiu-jitsu before and I've done this many times. The, the first thing I usually do is I explain to them, okay, what jiu-jitsu is really about. And then I say to them, we're going to play a little game here, okay? I'm going to I'm going to play guard. And this is the guard. And you're going to try and pass the guard. And the reason why you're trying to pass the guard is because it's dangerous whenever you're in the guard. And I know you don't know how to pass the guard. And I don't expect you to be able to do it. What I want is I wanted you to try, okay? And uh, just try and figure out a way to pass. And they'll go, okay, so, you know, your objective is to get the side control, mount or back, and I'm just going to try and keep you in now. Okay, let's go. And you see at first they're a little bit tentative, depending on who they are, a little bit tentative, and then they start getting a little bit more confident and confident. They start trying to play, and then suddenly they throw your legs out of the way, and they almost get there, and they get excited, and it's fun, and they start getting into it, and they feel more comfortable, and they start getting in the moment, and they start using problem solving to solve you know, the situation that's at hand. So when I train people like that and I create small little games for them, one, they have so much fun, they get a really good workout and they learn so much more. And I've had people, you know, 
that have come to me, you know, within the first year of training or six months and or a couple sessions. And, and this, these are the way I run all my sessions. They're all games. And they, they say the same shit. It's like, dude, I, I felt like I learned more in this one session than what I have in the last six months. And it's not anything I teach them. It's just I'm allowing them, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm creating a little environment for them to actually figure things out themselves. And as you get better, you don't need those kind of games as much because you can start doing it yourself. But to start off, I think the games are phenomenal to in, in helping people develop in those different areas. And then once you get really good, then you can start, you know, you can have your own games in your own head and, and play them all the time and, and people don't even know. Like I'll go roll with people and it'll be very different outcomes all the time. Like I'll go wrestle people and some days I'm wrestling really light and it'll go back and forth and I'm getting taken down. And, uh, you know, if someone's watching, they could be like, damn, you know, Kit's not doing that well. That other guy's really good. But they don't know what, you know, what I'm working on and what I'm trying to do. And I might be trying to allow them the first two moves to set something up so I can counter it. It's just not working. And, you know, I just have to have the ego or the, the lack of ego to, to not have to sit there and go, oh, now I have to win and stuff like that. Or now I have to tell you, oh, I was only playing around. It's like, you just do it. <laughs> You know, and then some other days I'll come out and I'll, you know, I'll go really hard. And it, the feedback's always so different because they're so confused. They're like, oh man, I felt like I did good today. I'm like, fuck, I felt like I was terrible today. But then I realize like what I'm working on, you know, and that's the same with, with everyone has the same problem. It's very hard to, to, uh, acknowledge your own progression because of that reason sometimes you come in you feel like uh, everything i touch is is gold and sometimes you come in and you feel like i'm fucking the worst thing in on the you know on the planet mm -hmm. so with like individual technique so you you create these sort of game scenarios which i guess in, in some degree we do that with isolation spine but it sounds like you go a step further and and put people into to more precise positions perhaps on occasion mm -hmm. and then obviously technique does does play a part to, at, at some point i mean do you ever layer that stuff in or do you just leave that up to the students to kind of go off and figure that out once they understand the the idea and and the purpose of what they're trying to do here's the thing it, the better i am as a coach the less i teach and so if i can do my job really well i don't show them anything and i don't say anything if i can do my job really well the word the you know the less I do my job, the more I'm going to start teaching, the more I'm going to have to use techniques and stuff. And I'm, I'm pretty good at doing what I do now without using it. But let's say if I did have to or I thought I had to use a technique as an example, well, I would just show it one as an example or what I would do, which would be better – is I wouldn't show it, but I would create games inside every step of that technique and I would get them to play that. And then they would end up getting tricked into to learning that thing themselves. But what I try and I, I look at jujitsu like a conversation, okay? And a technique is like a sentence. Do we drill sentences when we're talking? No. <laughs> you know, and would it be beneficial for us to drill sentences? No. It would make us rigid, rigid. It would make it harder for us to articulate ourselves. It would be harder for us to get what we want out of a conversation or to, you know, manipulate whoever we want. So I try and avoid any of that kind of stuff and learn and, and teach people just how to talk in jiu-jitsu. And what that requires is, one, a lot of listening and a lot of learning. You need to learn and understand what every single word means and why you're using it. And then you need to learn how to bend those words to, to really articulate yourself in your own voice. And, and that's something, you know, that I also use in writing, you know, this correct grammar but there's bending words to really give it some kind of style or, or feeling, you know, that which may not be completely correct, but it really works really well. And it's the same thing in jiu-jitsu. There's certain things that I'm going to do that are not the most, uh, you know, standard movements. They're actually quite, uh, you know, it could be even like goofy if you, if you say like a very, um, the word escapes me right now, but um I will use things that are very – I'm trying to think of this fucking word. I can't get away. I'm still <laughs> uh, very – not abnormal, but let's say abnormal for the moment until my brain wakes up. Uh, and it wouldn't be what I would normally recommend, but it works so well in the moment because you're not expecting it. You know, so like whenever I'm in a position and I'm thinking about what to do, and it's the same thing we do with language. We just do it so quick and so subconsciously that we're not thinking about it. But I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm looking at not only, not only am I listening to what you're saying, I'm looking at what you're doing 
Uh, are you nodding your head? Are you listening to me? Your eyes veering off somewhere else? Do, do, do are you in space? Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's all going to formulate the way I'm uh, going to help me formulate my sentence that I'm coming at you with. So the same thing in jujitsu. When I'm rolling with you, I'm looking at where are you looking? How how tired are you? Uh, what kind of mats are we on? What are you wearing? Are you wearing a long sleeve rash guard, a short rash guard? Is it a, is it a loose long sleeve rash guard? Um, you know, how strong are you? Uh, you know what? What have we done? What have you done in the past to me? What I feel like you know, and I'm trying to use all this against you, and, and I'm trying to come up with a solution that I think one is going to be the most energy efficient solution, and two is going to be the one thing that you expect the least. And if I can do that, then I've got a pretty good shot at beating you, as long as I have some kind of understanding of jujitsu. Um, so th- there's a lot that goes into the way that I'm thinking, and and very rarely. Does it come out the exact same? It's all, and it, even if it looks like it is, it's always slightly different. So I, I have very little. Uh, I hold very little value in techniques. I, I look at them like pickup lines in the in uh, you know the language industry. It's like yeah, you can be really shit and learn a couple pickup lines and get a little bit of a boost, but it's only going to slow you down in the long run. And uh, there's no fundamental techniques. There's fundamental positions, there's fundamental concepts that don't change, but there are no fundamental techniques and there's no one technique or many techniques that you have to learn to be good at jiu-jitsu. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of really good jiu-jitsu guys that have no idea what some you know positions are called or whatever. They just go in there and they improvise and they're really good. And as long as you can do that, it doesn't matter. So I get in a position that people always ask me, Kit, you know, what do you do? And they'll they'll throw the name out there. I was like, okay, okay come and show me because I have no idea what, what that is. <laughs> because <laughs> I just I, I plus I put such little emphasis and value on techniques that I don't really care. I understand why it's important to have names because, I mean, it's going to be very easy to articulate what you're talking about, but it's very easy to go too far that way and then end up like uh, being all about techniques. And um, But it's, you know, it's hard to grasp, but I tell everyone, I spend one week or one day doing this type of training and you'll be convinced no matter who you are. I've had that with so many people, but – the people that don't believe me or don't get on are the ones that are too stubborn to even try it. Mm. And it's not easy to wrap your brain around and most people are never going to be able to do it without actually just stumbling upon it. And let's be honest, most people are not that smart. Most people don't have a very high cue and I'm including most jiu-jitsu people are not very smart and they're never going to come up with a solution on themselves. Sorry, they're never going to come to this conclusion on themselves, but by themselves. And um, so you've got to kind of force them into it and uh, but every single person that I've had try it has come back with the same thing like okay holy shit I understand what you're saying now but it takes a long time to to get them to figure that out so there's a lot of black belt world champions out there that'll sit there still to this day saying uh, you got to drill and you got to do this and they're world champions so it's really confusing and you got kit that's not a black belt world champion um, telling you and I don't even spend that much time doing jiu-jitsu telling me what to do uh, the difference is and this is the thing that most people need to figure out is like you know one. Even a broken clock is right two times a day. But two, when, you, when you're when you a Brazilian jiu-jitsu, like most Brazilian champions that I know started when they were about six years old and they were training with other world champions all the way till now they're 35 years old and they're like, I'm you know five-time black belt world champion. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. It's like, yeah, you, you spent literally 20 to 30 times longer to do what I did. And you're sitting there telling people that you know better than me because you did it a lot longer. It's like it's that doesn't mean you, you can afford to make so many mistakes at that level because you've had so much time. You know what I mean? Compared to what most people like us, we don't have that much time. Okay, you, I, I I can't tell you. Okay, listen, <laughs> I can say I, Paul. Okay, go out and spend thirty years and uh, and do all your drilling, and you're still going to be really good because it's going to be enough of what you do outside of drilling that's going to help you that you can get to that level but i'm telling you it's going to slow your progression so much um and it's just it's it's unfortunate that so many of these people don't have the awareness or intellect to be able to come to this conclusion because it would save so many people so much so much trouble and this is a big reason why you know not that many people reach the pinnacle in jiu-jitsu because most of them are training the wrong way still it's getting better like most people are starting to figure it out now but it, it, it's never going to happen for for a lot of them, and uh, you know, a good example is like a lot of these guys make a lot, like sell a lot of their DVDs, mm. and you can have to look at like a lot of these coaches that are like you know 
you know, we we drill, and that's why I'm a champion coach. And go, well, how many champions did you actually create in a certain amount of time? And I can't be judged on this because I don't even have my own school, so it doesn't matter. Um, but you know, there's a lot of them. Like, oh, I've got three world champions here. It's like, yeah, those three guys came from other schools already, really good. Uh, who have you brought from from scratch? That's not very good. And very few of them, and I'm telling you, you think about the top ones, and I'm not going to name any names right now, but think about the top ones. How many of those guys came to them already fucking good? Most of them. There is one guy uh, that probably has a little bit of a different perspective on training. I know he's very big in drilling, but he has raised a lot of of world champions, homegrown ones, and that's Lloyd Irvin. Um, we definitely – and uh, neither of us really know exactly what we're doing in terms of, of teaching, but I think I'm, I'm I still I'm not I, I'm not bought that the the drilling stuff makes his guys really good. I think that he instills a lot of mental fortitude that makes people really good and knows how to train. But like he is one guy that has taken uh, a lot of homegrown students and turned them into world champions. But there's very few people that have actually done that. Very few people. Yes, it's, I I roll most days, don't I, during the day, and it's definitely helped me. I don't care what anyone says. Me just being able to go in, do an hour of just sparring, just rolling every day, it does definitely help because you have to feel it, don't you, with jujitsu? You have to feel the difference in body position, body type. You know, holding just holding positions and all that sort of stuff. You can't drill that over and over again. Drilling's, drilling's good when you have, like, I have problems, so I'll go to whoever and say, oh, I'm stuck here, can you help me? But other than that, yeah, I think it definitely helps. Yeah, I guess I guess that's a, there's there's potentially a small argument there, isn't there, where obviously you, uh, you've you obviously got the, the benefit of intelligence on your side um, and that ability to, to kind of analyse situations and problems all very well, whereas, as you rightfully say, a lot of people don't have... Well, any, any, any degree of intelligence, but certainly <laughs> high level intelligence. Um, so there's that ability to shortcut, I guess, that that whole process, right? So if you do encounter problems, that's where a lot of people may look to uh, an instructor, um, potentially to, to say, I've got this scenario, I'm stuck. How do you deal with it? And kind of s- to save solving it themselves. Do you think in doing that, that there's like a, there's a loss of something in regard to not solving it your own self? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're robbing yourself the, the, uh, the opportunity to to really get a lot of you know, gain a lot of knowledge and, and figure things out yourself. And I, there was a book about happiness, and it was especially with men. Like men's ability to, to find happiness is in their ability to solve their own problems. If you come to jujitsu and you can't solve any of your problems because you're constantly asking the teacher, it's like trying to learn mathematics by using the back of the maths book all the time. Yeah, when it comes sure. To test, you're going to struggle because you don't have it. So uh, I always tell people, jujitsu is a lot more fun when you can solve your own problems because one, you feel good about it. Two, you know, you, you build confidence and you get so much better. You get so much more information. So, but there is going to be like that. You know, there's going to be someone that's like, okay, I'm coming into jujitsu uh, because I want to lose weight. I don't give a shit about learning anything. I just want to lose weight, and uh, you know, or you know, I want I want to come in here, but I don't want to put any more thought into this. I, you know, I'm a billionaire outside of jujitsu, and that's all I care about. Usually, this is not the case. Usually, the billionaires are the ones that are very thoughtful of, of their training. Um, but let's say that, like, you know, I don't want to think about it. So, yeah, for those people, I'm not the, I'm not your person. You know, I, I can teach you like that, but it's not gonna. I know it's not gonna help you uh, very much. But there there are those clientels. Uh, that clientele, but uh, I think most people, when they get in jiu-jitsu, they become quite obsessed with jiu-jitsu and they really want to progress faster and they, they think about, you know, okay, how can I take shortcuts? Well, the shortcut would be the instructor telling me exactly what to do, but unfortunately, it's a uh, it's a little false shortcut and it ends up costing you a lot more time in the long run and, and really – yeah, removes your ability to to figure things out. So the what I you know what I tell people, which is the shortcut, it doesn't really it doesn't really come off as a shortcut because it's a lot more work. But it'll just it'll compound so much in the long run that uh, you're going to wish wish you did it because you know it's a, it's going to require you to really think about what's going on. 
It's going to require you to look at jujitsu like a, uh, a scientist and like a using it as like lab experiments. So, like for example, Danny, what you were saying before, where you know you get this position and like, okay, I'm having problems here, and you can drill a technique. Okay, that's one way to solve it. Okay, tell me what the you know what the solution is and drill it. But I'm telling you, that's gonna it's gonna last a very short period of time because those people are going to figure out what you just did and they're going to counter that, and then you're going to go, okay, well now I need to counter what they just countered, and now I need a new technique coach can you teach me you go to spend a lot of time drilling it and then, and every single time they're going to work it out and if you're unlucky and you're going against someone like me i'm going to work it out the first time you do it every single time so you're going to spend you know hours drilling something that i'm going to figure out in 20 seconds and uh and it can become really frustrating it's just because the way i've learned all of jiu-jitsu i have that ability now i have that superpower you know i was at lachlan giles's gym recently and they were looking at some position for a while and he's like kit come over here can you uh can you escape we can't escape this position can you escape here and i did it in like two seconds and he's like <laughs> see i fucking knew he would like, <laughs> <laughs> so they must fucking hate you though mate they must fucking hate you because that must just it must be so fucking demoralizing do you know what i mean like you say if they're, if they're drilling that for fucking ages and then you just come over and just fucking yeah boop see you later especially especially at the top level guys <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, I remember I was training with uh, Leandro Lowe and uh, Andre Galval one time at, when we were all black belts. We still all are black belts, but before Leandro passed, uh, we were at the World Championships in Abu Dhabi and we were just exchanging some uh, some techniques and some solutions. I come up with this like cool solution to when someone on a as you'd how to take their back and uh, and they were showing me some stuff. So, I showed them that and they were practicing it and, and drilling it. And then they showed me a couple of things and I was like, ah, oh, sick. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah practice it, practice it. And I'm like, I said, no, no, it's, I got it. And they're like, no, drill it. And I'm like, no, no, bro, I don't need to. I can see what you did. I'll do, I'll go, I'll, I'll try and do it on someone like while rolling right now in competition. Like for me, it's really easy. I can usually, <laughs> I can see this. It, it makes sense. You know what I mean? Uh, but a lot of people, like if you learn through drilling techniques, no matter who you are, how good you are, you're going to look at every technique is going to look like a new language until you practice it over and over and over again. But when you do it this way, you don't need to practice it. You can see it. It's like it's almost like you're seeing through the matrix. Uh, you know, you show me a technique. I can look at you doing one in comp and I can go, oh, yeah, I see what he did there. You know, the hardest thing is when I can't see. Like I'm, like, I'm looking, I'm like, fuck, I can't see what's going on, on the other side there. But for me, it's very easy. I'm like, okay, I see what he did here. But I'm looking at more in terms of conceptually. I, okay, he was, you know, removing the guy's ability to post in a certain direction and he used his legs to generate leverage over there. Cool. Oh, it was a nice little way he did that. Cool. But I'm not going to go out there and practice that and drill that. I have no interest in doing that. I know it'll, that what, it, what happened in that space split moment was perfect for that moment and maybe not even perfect but that's that was the solution in that and it's like you know when we're having a conversation right now and that there's going to be a select uh, uh vernacular going back and forth if someone came back in and said, hey i want to practice that same conversation and podcast you guys had i'm going to drill those words that you guys say oh, it would make no sense at all like these words are specific for the moment right now and a lot of jujitsu should be focused you know in the same in the same uh with the same tokens like we are in this moment there are things going on that uh people outside of the moment are not going to be able to see or not be able to feel and uh, we need to figure these things out ourselves and we need to come up with solutions that are handpicked for this very moment, which will never repeat again the exact same way. It may be similar and we could create a cookie cutter system of techniques to, to bypass this, but what you're really doing is you're just bypassing the student's uh, necessity to think or solve the problems themselves, which is going to leave the students very, very vulnerable as time goes on. Where they just okay, here's John. He drilled everything. He's got all the technique, but he can't think. He can't solve anything himself. Here's this dude. Never drilled anything in that, but like the dude's problem solving ability is fucking unbelievable. Now you put him in any position, and he'll come up with a solution far quicker. And the more you do it, you know, the faster you can become solving. It wasn't like I was solving like hard problems when I first started jujitsu. My first problem was trying to figure out how the fucking how a triangle worked, and I couldn't even figure that out for like two or three weeks with my cousin on the on the floor in his lounge room while his one-year-old daughter would watch him trying to figure out, hey, do I put my leg this way? <laughs> you know, is this, do I Americana this way or this way? I didn't know the difference. There was, you know, it wasn't easy at the start, but the more I did it, the better I got at it. Yeah, man, I'm still a bit confused about how you take someone's back from an Oma Pilata. I'm trying to solve that puzzle right <laughs> now. So, you had that look on your yeah, face I've, for I've, 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 I've
<laughs> I, I wanted to ask in regard to the uh, the ability to develop the skill of problem solving. I'm kind of picturing you as, as a child now, just like solving multiple Rubik's cubes or something. But is it a skill that you've you've kind of developed, and do you think it is a skill that people can be shit at and then improve over time? Yeah, I think any I think every skill can be developed, depending if there's some kind of you know mental impingement or something. But uh, I think. Uh, I think it's like everything, you know, it's like weights, you, you know, you want to get strong, what do you do? You go to the gym and you you do weights. If you push too hard at first, you're going to tear a muscle and you're going to go backwards and regress. If you don't push hard enough, you're going to be unchallenged and unchanged and nothing's going to happen. It's the same thing with problems. You need to find problems that are one in the realm of you being able to solve. Otherwise, it's going to be too hard. You're going to get brain fog, mental fatigue and not even want to do it and it'd be disheartened or it's going to be, you know, and uh, it's not going to challenge you at all and you're not going to grow from it. So it, it's really important to try and figure out, you know, what is the size of the problem that I need to solve? And that's going to come down to who your training partners are a lot of the time and, and where they're good and where they're not. You want to learn wrestling? I probably wouldn't go straight to a, uh, a world champion wrestler straight away. It's not that he's not going to have uh, good advice, but he's going to, but to practice anything and to make all these first mis mistakes, you need someone that like is going to allow you to do that uh, organically, not like, oh, I'm going to let you do these kind of things. You know, one of my students right now who's um, the writer, the, the writer, my writing mentor is my student jiu-jitsu, loves jiu-jitsu, and he trains with me. You know, he only trains with me and another student of mine, Bogdan, who's really good as well, a Russian guy. And um, the thing I always tell him is like, it's going to be hard, bro, because you're going with two really high-level guys and, and you've only been doing this for two years it's going to be very hard for you to develop the confidence that you need to start getting further in these steps because the only way you're going to do that is if we let you because there's such a, a big difference. So what I'm trying to really – and it's hard because he doesn't have a lot of time because he's always writing. I'm trying to get him to go to a class where he has other people that he can try and try shit on and, and start developing that confidence. And, and basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to find simpler problems for him to solve rather than the fucking gigantic algorithm that me and my other Russian friend Bogdan are going to present him. So it's really important to to know, you know, where you're at when it comes to problem solving and find problems that are, are one, going to challenge you, but two, not too much, not too little. And, and I feel like that's what the balance that you need to do. And if you do that, you're going to develop really well. And no, I wasn't like this uh, great problem solver since I was a kid or anything like that. I think it was more... I just found very little interest in learning the, the traditional um, the traditional way. You know, if you look at like the industrial age model of education that was created in the sixties, designed in the sixties to create factory workers and stuff like that, and we a lot of you know Australia used the same model still to today. And uh, when I was at school, I just found it very unappealing to to practice a process like a repetitive process, which were all cookie cutter designs. Like we were doing, I love art. Okay. I love art. I love uh, drama. Okay, so like acting and stuff. I love all that kind of stuff. Uh, and sport. They were my three favorite subjects. No, the three subjects I failed in school because I just didn't love the way they did it. When we did art, it would be like, okay, we're going to create this this exact model here, and this is the first step. We're going to do this, and then we're going to do. It. It's like, fuck, man, that's so boring. Like, mm, that's that's not art, is it? Nah, I want to paint a little demon here, and I want to practice <laughs> and make mistakes and do shit, and you know. And the same with sport. Like, I I didn't care for the the theory of sport. I wanted to get out there and I wanted to play sport. I was mm -hmm. one of the best people when it came to playing it. I was one of the fucking worst when it came to talking about it because I had no interest in it and the way it was the way it was designed in the way it was taught was just really unstimulating to me so I failed a lot of school or but I would say school failed me because I wanted to learn how to create and I wanted to learn how to and it's not I wanted to learn like that's just the way I was leaning I wanted to learn to create and I you know I was more leaning towards trying to figure that out through problem solving and uh School just wasn't like that. So I, I really struggled in school. I always felt like I was dumb. My parents probably thought that I was stupid as well because of that. Um, but it was just the way my brain worked was not really designed for, for that. I didn't have the temperament for that. So I would sit there and anyone walk past my class and I'm like, what's going on? There's something exciting over there. And like, kid, pay attention. Like what? Uh, and I, you know, I just, I really struggled. I would do all, I hated homework. I hated everything at school. I was so, I was so happy not to do school again. And then I went to work and I was like, God damn, school was better than work. This is fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs>
I hated work and I was like, damn, so I, I, need, I needed to try and figure out a way. And it was, it was kind of funny because I, um, I, I, met, I was unemployed for a bit and I was, uh, I used to go to this nightclub all the time. I never, I never drank anymore. And I, I was actually the, I was actually the, like the bouncers really liked me because I would be sober and I would look like a bouncer half the time because I would be wearing black and I'd be standing like on the edge of the uh, edge of the dance floor like this trying to find like some hot girls or something like that. But I just looked like a real creeper. So I looked like <laughs> I was security and the security guys liked me. So we got along and then I, I started, uh, there was this girl and uh, she was working at the bar there and uh, she was like a, she was like a model, like a uh, magazine model. So she was like the, the more pretty one of this bar. And, uh, everyone would like go up to her and hit on her and stuff. And I would never give her the time of the day. I would, and more because I just didn't think I could. <laughs> I <was> like, yeah. <laughs> uh, but that ended up working well for me. And she started trying to get my attention. And then we, uh, we ended up dating and uh, it was a mess. She was, she was a nightmare. Let's be honest. Uh, at the end of it, but like uh, we were together for a bit and she introduced me to a friend who was a, a millionaire and uh, his name is Danny Voyer. And, uh, we went out for dinner one time and we got along really well. And uh, he said, look, he goes, you seem to think a lot like me. Why don't you uh, come and work at the factory? I'll give you a job. So this is when I was doing jiu-jitsu as well. I think I was a purple belt at this stage and uh, I, I become unemployed for a little bit. And he's like, I'll give you a job and uh, I'll put you in this class of mine that I'm starting. And it's called a – I call it the Hunters of Excellence class. And um, so I, I ended up working uh, for, for him and I was in his factory and I started doing this class. And this class was basically – it taught us a few things and it, it, it used like the, um, the secret uh, law of attraction and, uh, and manifesting and all these kind of things and uh, goal setting and create. And this is the first time I'd heard about any of this kind of stuff and I really enjoyed it. So I started doing I started doing like affirmations in the morning in the mirror. I created a vision board. Uh, I started listening to a lot of self-help stuff and uh, got right into um, – Who's the fucking big self help guy? Really speaks like he's got a real deep voice. That was nothing like the way he sounds. I prayed for him. <laughs> Tony, Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins. Yeah, yeah. And he, yeah. At the time, so I loved that I loved it, and like my life started turning around. I was like, man, I started being far more positive and really enjoying it, and uh, and I, I started thinking, you know, fuck, you know what? I can do whatever I want. Uh, and I, I thought, fuck, what do I want to do? I'm like, well, I like jujitsu. Okay, it's probably one thing I'm doing that I like. So I'm like, well, if I you know, and at the time I was thinking about jiu-jitsu, I was thinking before that, I was thinking, well, if I did jiu-jitsu for 10 years, I could get a black belt and then I could open a school that would just be big enough that I wouldn't have to work and that would be nice. You know, but after I did this, I was like, fuck this. I want to get, get my black belt faster than anyone in the world. I want to I want to be a – and it might not have been purple belt, sorry. I might be exaggerating. I think I was actually – Actually, I think I was actually white or blue at the time, sorry. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to get this in three years because uh, I heard BJ Penn did it in three years, which he didn't, but, like, that's what people were saying back there. He did, like, seven years of no gi and then did three years of gi. It's like, that's not three Yeah, years. sounds about right, yeah. And <laughs> so I was like, okay. Sometimes you hear that. <laughs> so I thought, oh, no, no, that's, a, that's my goal is become one of the best in the world. And then I'll go to MMA. So I started doing that and I missed the three-year mark. I got four years. Uh, and then I decided not to go into um, – into MMA because I thought, well, look, I, I, my progression was like jiu-jitsu world champion, MMA champion, then acting. I'm like, oh, I might as well skip the MMA and just go straight to acting. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, I did that and it, and it helped a lot. Like the stuff that I learned with him was really good and really beneficial and I, I probably – I really need to start doing a lot more of it now. Um but it, it really helped me and he helped me a lot. Just one, believe that I could do anything and then that allowed me to take the steps in which I needed to start doing anything and and it, uh, it compounded really well. So that, I was kind of lucky with that timing that, that gave me the confidence to start looking at jiu-jitsu as a career. And then, you know, I started – I ended up quitting my job not long after. I started teaching like two or three privates uh, a, uh, a week and, uh, and it was only like seventy dollars I was charging or something for them. I was living off of a friend's couch, and uh, you know, and then just things got better and better. And you know, now I, you know, now I made more money than uh, I would have ever dreamt. You know, back then, you know, I think it was the first time, the first time I made like a thirty thousand dollar month through online sales of, of products, I was like, my parents couldn't believe it. They're just like, <laughs> hold on, you, 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 what made that much money? And then it went to like, you know, a couple of years later, it was like $130,000 a month. And they're just like, even me back then, it's like, fuck, man, 
I'm so glad I did this because it's like, you know, I had a lot of arguments with my father. Like, you know, my dad was like, you're going to be a fucking bum your whole life. <laughs> Uh, get a real job and stuff like that but you know it's it's not his fault it's just the way the the world he were, lived in mm. pre you know i mean we were in the pre-internet world uh, i presume if you guys are as old as me 38 um but he was uh, you know obviously the generation before that so him thinking about making money online he didn't even want to pay for shit online he didn't never want to put his cards <laughs> online because he thought i'm gonna get robbed you know <laughs> straight away <laughs> so like it was different for him but it ended up paying off uh, quite well but it also like like everything. It's like it it worked for its moment, and then you know, and then I wanted to change and do something else and start from the fucking bottom again, and and that's where I am now. Is like, uh, and it's hard to do. It's hard to go from something like jujitsu where you're well, you know, I, when I was competing specifically, like I was well respected, uh, admired, and it felt good. And then you stop competing and you see like you kind of realize that people just like you because they feel like they can get something from you, you know, either some knowledge or some kind of clout by hanging out with you and taking a photo of you. But the moment you don't, you're not in that limelight anymore, they start treating you like, who, you know, whoever you are, which is someone that just doesn't offer them much anymore. And that, that definitely hurt. It hurt my ego a lot where i would normally go to tournaments and you know there'd be a line of people you know trying to get photos and take and shake my hand and then i would now i would go and most people wouldn't even recognize who you are anymore uh but you know that's that's the journey of moving on to do different things and then uh, going into you know acting and then it's like suddenly like people are just like who the fuck are you some kind of fucking <laughs> talk, like, get the fuck out of my way and then like and now you know i, I got into room that, I don't want to use a fucking roundabout way of uh, going on a different story here, but I was um, when I, after about 2014, I was doing jujitsu and I kind of got a little bit bored of it, and I felt like you know what I'm at, I'm one of the best in the world now. I would say I'm like I feel like I'm top five in my weight division. If I spend another year, I'll probably win a black belt world championship. The hardest thing is winning a black belt world championship is this, you've got to have a lot of luck and you've got to put a lot of time in. You know, you can go in there any given day and you get injured before the tournament or you get a, you know, a bad first round or second round and you can lose it and still be the best. And it's like, it's just a matter of time and, and persistence. Uh, you know, and I just don't want to, didn't want to put that in. So for me, it's like, for me to get to the next level, it's going to like, I'm going to end up damaging my body so much to try. And I was a lot older than most of the people I was competing with then. Um, it's going to take, uh, it's just not going to be worth it for me. And, you know, for what I really want to do, which is I've always wanted to be an actor since I was a little kid. I wanted to to to, to write and film stuff, and why don't why don't I just get into that? And I ended up like quitting jujitsu 2014. I was in London actually at the time, and uh, I did Polaris, and uh, I was in London. And it was really fucking. It was in winter, and it was really depressing. And I was <laughs> like, at just one point, I had ten seminars set up, and I just thought to myself. I want to go home. And I literally <laughs> called my ma- like my guy that was managing me back then, and I just said, "Hey, man, can you give me a flight?" And he booked me a flight that like early that morning. I, I you know, I would think it was like I called him like midnight, and he and then he like sent me all these messages. Like, I got one at five a.m. You got to get up, get up. So I went, <laughs> fucking, I flew home, which is a long way from Australia to fucking England. It's like a twenty-one yeah. hour some shit. I know, mate. It's fucking worth it though, mate. England's depressing. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean, I can fucking feel you then. I love like I love England in the in the summer. Like I I, I love coming there, but winter is not for me. Yeah, the summer lasts for about a week. That's yeah, the problem. So it's only two weeks a year, mate. It's <laughs> yeah. fucking normal. So I, I left. Uh, I left, and then I I, I I I was pretty happy to retire from jujitsu at that stage. And then I went back into playing football, and I really enjoyed it. My brother was coaching a football squad, and I, I joined him, and I assistant coached. And the, that were the bottom of the ladder, and we got it to the top of the ladder for that year. And I think I was playing, and I was playing a really good football. And it was it was good because they were really young kids, and they were a little bit intimidated by some of the uh, bigger squads. So me and my brother were playing. My brother's six foot four, and he's built like a fucking German army tank. And uh, <laughs> so me and him were playing. We were like the you know like the Bash brothers from fucking Mighty Ducks. And so <laughs> no, one, no one fucked with any of the club because like, and they thought I was an MMA fighter. Like the whole league was talking about it. Like they didn't realize it was jujitsu, but like, but I was big then. And uh, and because of the wrestling and stuff, fuck, I would tackle the shit out of these, and no one could tackle us. So we become really good tacklers, and and uh, and we did really well. But at, at round five, I uh, there was about five seconds left in the game, and my brother was playing actually, my other brother as well, and I went to pivot. And I handballed the ball to him, and as I pivoted, my knee just went, and I snapped my ACL. So, no way. 
Yeah, it's like fucking. That's the worst. My my own opponent was behind oh, me. He's yeah. like, so "Are you okay?" I'm like, "Oh, I have no idea what I just did, but I felt this fucking crunching and it hurt." So I snapped my ACL, and uh, I ended up, I didn't realize for ten weeks actually I was still trying to come back to football, and I was uh, I had physios tell me, "Oh, you've just hurt the meniscus. You'll be fine." So I kept trying to come back, but then like one night I'd feel like I can run. The next night I'd feel like there's a stone in between my knee, and then I I, I was training with Lachlan Giles. And I went and did a session uh, of jiu-jitsu up there. I was still training, but just like every now and then, just not not the way I was. And uh, I uh, he he tested it out, and he's like, "Bro, something's grabbing, but I don't think it's your ACL. Go get it. Go get an MRI." So I got an MRI, and they're like, <laughs> "The doctor's like, bro, he goes, did you walk in here?" And I'm like, "Yeah, why?" He's like, "You've he goes, your knee's fucked. He goes, <laughs> your ACL, you've torn your MCL, your PCL, your LCL, and you've completely split the lateral meniscus." He goes, "You shouldn't be be able to walk." I said, "I've been running around, bro." And uh, he's like, "Yeah, you need to get uh, surgery." And I had no insurance and I had no money, um, so I couldn't do anything. So at that stage, I was sitting there and I, I left. And I, I don't want to get like bummed out at any time, so I'm just like, "Hey, it's happened." I was really loving football at the time too, which you know did bump me out. But I'm like, there's nothing I can do. What can I do? I'm like, oh, I've always wanted to get into acting. So for me, I've always got to have something that I'm like, I'm striving for. Otherwise, I feel like I'm dead. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to get into acting. So I uh, I told my brother. My brother was he was in uh, directing school. He's a director now, but he mm-hmm. was um, in uh, school for for uh, film school. And he spoke to a friend of his, and he got me a, an interview with his manager. We got along really well. And then we, um, he got me like an audition. I got like a role on Jack Irish, which stars Guy Pearce. Met Guy Pearce, did that little speaking role, and that was fun. And then I, I ended up getting like just so coincidentally, this guy contacted me on Facebook, and he's like, "Hey man, are you an actor as well as director?" And I'm like, "Yeah," because at the time you can only put actor director. He goes, mm-hmm. "Look, I'm casting a movie right now, and you look very much like the way I picture one of the leads. Would you be willing to do an audition?" I'm thinking, "What is this? Like a fucking a school film or some shit?" And then, uh, what sort of fucking school are you thinking about, mate? <laughs> <laughs> a, a bold bearded dude at school. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, I, I Google him. I'm like, holy shit! He did this movie that I've seen at the the uh, at the video shop, like, like you know, Blockbuster back in the day. I'm like, fuck! I've seen that movie. So I do an audition, and then he really likes it. He gets me another audition. Le- next thing you know, I'm one of the leads for a 32 million dollar feature film shot in Belgium. So I'm over there. I'm acting in that. One of the best fucking times of my life. I loved it. So I did that movie. I got paid like, you know, not much, but $55,000 was still good. Uh, and I ended up using that to fix my knee. I knew that like I, I love acting. I love filmmaking. All this is so much fun for me. I, fi- I used it to fix my knee, but I knew that I had to move from Australia to America to do it because Australian films are just is, is shit. I could go to UK would be great because I love UK films as well and they've got mm-hmm. fantastic actors, but Australia just doesn't have much. You know, very rarely do you see something come out of here. Um, so I thought I might as well just go move to America. So I, I got my knee fixed. I went to America. Um, it took me like two years to get a work visa and I finally got a work visa. And then as soon as I got a work visa, I had to become part of SAG, which is the, uh, the union for film here. So to get part of SAG, you have to get three, you have to work on three SAG films to be part of SAG. To work on a SAG film, you have to be part of SAG. So it's like a fucking stupid little uh, <laughs> like so fucking- dumb. So what you have to do is you have to kind of get a job through someone who knows you as something that doesn't need to be a part of the union to do it, like uh, carrying boxes or some shit. And then what they do is they say, oh, we needed this guy here. He was carrying boxes. He was the only one on set, and we had to use him for one of the scenes, you know. And then we get then you then you get a um, I think I think it's called like a credit or some shit. I forget what it's called. Mm-hmm. But basically, I did that three times through people I knew, and then I finally got SAG. And then, like, as soon as I got SAG, fucking COVID hit, and they're like, "Hey, nothing's happening." So I bought a gaming computer and I started gaming professionally. And I was like, "Fucking!" I was playing. Games. What was you playing? I was playing Apex uh, Legends, like the Battle Royale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've played Apex. Good. Yeah, I know. I loved that. And yeah. I was playing uh, a bit of Call of Duty Warzone as well. Yeah. So I kind of go yeah. through shooters, and I play other things like Resident Evil or. Uh, you know, I love Skyrim and all those kind of stuff and GDA and that. But for for streaming, it was more like shooters. So I was like, mate, Warzone was so good, wasn't it? Warzone oh, was man. so good in lockdown, mate. It was fucking yeah, 
Honestly, it's like some of the best times of my life, mate, playing, <laughs> playing Warzone for, for a year, getting fat. I loved it. <laughs> Dude, I, I was streaming like all day and there was one time I was playing Apex Legends and I, I, I was in a, a pubs match and I was just sort of, I was streaming live and I'm just on my phone and I'm looking and we go to drop in and then I, I look at this name of this guy and it's, the name's Imperial Hell and Imperial Hell is like the, the best gamer on that game. Yeah, and, I know. Yeah, uh, he's fucking insane. Yeah, so oh, yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, is that fucking him? And I'm like, he's <laughs> he's going off on his own because there's three of us and we're all supposed to go together. He's going off on his own. Our third has just left the game. It's just me and him and I'm on the other side of the map. And then I, I look at my my stream account. I had about 12 people watching me. Suddenly, I got 100 people watching me and I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? And they're like, dude, you're playing with Imperial Hell. You're playing. I'm like, no way. So I'm like, I fucking, I'm like a little kid <laughs> in the candy store. I'm running to hit, across the other side of the map. I end up getting to him and me and him like, just, and I had a really good game. We destroyed the whole lobby, mainly him. But uh, <laughs> definitely me him. <laughs> they were going to my, like, my stream and they're like going to his stream and they're like, bro, you're playing with a, he's like, a, and I, I was saying like, he's an MMA guy or some shit. And he got, so he finishes his stream, like his match. And I said, GG's, bro, I'm a big fan. And he's like, GG's. And then he looks at my uh, my profile and he's like, holy shit, this guy could kill me. And he's like, should we rate him, chat? What do you think? So he was finishing his like thing. And so what he did is he rated me, which means all of his viewers go into my channel. So suddenly I'm playing and 16,000 people are watching me. And I'm like, oh my God, my fucking palms are like I'm on the keyboard and <laughs> the mouse. The balls are tingling. <laughs> I was more nervous than that than when I was in the Jiu-Jitsu World Championships. And I was like, fuck it, like, holy shit. But it was so much fun and I, like, it helped a lot. I got a lot of viewers from that. And I, and I really enjoyed it. But in the end, it was like once uh, COVID finished, I thought to myself, like, what do I really want to be doing? I love gaming. Like, don't get me wrong, I could game all day. And I, I'd become obsessive with it. But it's not a great lifestyle to live for me. I'm going to be sitting down all the time and uh, looking at computer screens. Probably not going to be great for a lot of different reasons. So I thought, what I really want to be doing, I really want to be like filming. So I thought I'll get back into acting. But the problem was, is there was a huge climate shift at that time from with with acting away from, you know, it went more into uh, what you would see, like you know. How do I say this without coming off fucking racist? Uh, it's like more so politically correct, it. you know. Uh, it, it, the the woke side of sort of mm -hmm. stuff started, you know, seeping in. Where I went from getting, you know, like let's say three or four auditions a month to maybe three or four auditions a year. Wow. And and you, we, we would see, you know, I got friends that are in that industry as well, and you would see calling call sheets that were just like for for auditions, like anything but Caucasian, anything but Caucasian. Uh, so it's just like, you know, the amount of, uh, auditions I had went so low that I'm like, if I ever want to make it in acting, I'm going to have to do it myself because I'm not getting, you know, the, and then not just the, the auditions low, the, the quality of the auditions were bad. It's like, and you know, the quality of characters that were going to white males, straight white males specifically just declined rapidly. And, uh, you're either like it's the baffling fool or the evil dude. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to have to do this myself. So I was like, well, Look, I'm an athlete. I know how to work hard. I know movies. I watched movies since I was a little fucking kid. I used to go to Blockbuster and get 10, 10 you know, VHSs a, a week and just abuse them all week. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I fucking love Blockbuster. Then, yeah, because yeah. you used to love yeah, it. Yeah. I fucking, I miss that. I was, I was explaining it to my boy recently. I was like, Jack, Blockbuster was the best. You used to go there, watch random fucking films you've never seen. You used to get your popcorn and all your shit and then go over. It used to be fucking amazing. Yeah, and then, like, my yeah. boy has just completely missed out on that. You know what I mean? May I, uh, do, do you ever see like Never Ending Story back in the day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the scene where the, the horse sinks in the mud oh, to his death? <laughs> That's so sad. As as a kid, so I, bu I, I, I burst out of Blockbuster in tears because they had that on the screen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that completely meltdown. <laughs> happy memories man <laughs> I, I used to watch like i used to get horror movies all the time i was a huge horror movie kid like i watched the exorcist when i was like 11 years old i was <laughs> i'm just fuck my brain up don't worry <laughs> yeah yeah mine was, mine was just like scream i think i, I watched out like 12 shit to myself but i think that was about it yeah dude uh, the exit i watched the exorcist 11 years old was one of the worst things i could ever do to myself <laughs> i'll tell you what the worst film i ever watched was my, my dad uh to, not made me watch it but he was like oh you gotta watch this and i was like 13 and my mate was over and we watched scum have you ever watched scum no oh mate he, so it fucking it scarred me for life mate it's it's it's, it's quite an old british film with ray winston about borstal <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. fucking. Up. And uh, there's a particular scene in it which is um, quite traumatizing for a young man to watch. Let's put it that way. Really? 
Were like traumatized, like the like the movie Sleepers, traumatizing. Or? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Very like much real so. brutal. But I didn't expect it, so he gave me no context. So I started watching it with my mate as well. We're like twelve. We might even be twelve. And uh, yeah, honestly, I was, I was. It always sticks. I'm like, it he's saves, fucking scarred me. <laughs> it saves having like the police getting arrested jail chat, right? Just watch this film and <laughs> yeah, you'll behave yourself. I think I was there. I was being a bit of a knob. He's like, what, Jess, mate? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, yeah, that's fucking fun, yeah. Now, mine was always horror movies, and I, I, but I I, I, I kind of like realized, like, like, I've been an athlete. I know what it takes to work. A lot of people in the film industry are not athletes, let's be honest. A lot of people in the film industry are people that were, like, probably bullied at school and a lot more emotionally inclined, probably less likely to ever do sport, Probably didn't most. I know. I know this is very uh, generalized, and it's not true for everybody. But a lot of people were the not so cool kids at school, and uh, they're not so popular kids, and they're not. You know. So for for me, it's like, well, I know these kids don't usually know what hard work is. They think they do, but they don't. You know, a, an athlete knows what fucking hard work is, and how like, you know, these guys would do like two or three hours a day, and be like, oh, it's so hard. You know what I mean? Like, it's just tough work. I'm like, dude. Do 15 hours and then tell me it's hard. So I thought I'm going to outwork these people. Plus, I've seen enough movies. I understand like how, how movies are. I just needed to learn how to write, which I had no fucking idea. So I uh, I made a promise to myself. I'm going to start writing movies until I'm so good that I get my own movies made. I'm going to cast myself in my own movies and I'm going to start. And then eventually, I'm going to learn how to direct my own movies and produce my own movies. So that's my goal right now is to, and I've been doing it for over two years now, is to uh, is to make my own movies because in the end, like in this situation now, I, I'm the only person that's going to, Getting me a career in film is me. And it's uh, just because of uh, a lot of different things. Look, it'd be hard enough to make a career without all this woke stuff that's going on, let alone with it is is, is far harder. So I, uh, I started writing two years ago and, uh, and now I have three scripts done. I've got a fourth one that I'm working on right now. Um, I absolutely love writing. I'm really enjoying it. I never thought that I would, one, be as good as what I am at writing or enjoy it as much as what I do. It's kind of like the acting's fun, you know, but what you're really doing is you're bringing, else, you're bringing someone else's ideas to life. But when you, mm. when you bring those ideas to life, it's so much more valuable. It's, it's very similar to what I loved in jiu-jitsu. It's not like I'm not like learning someone else's techniques. I'm creating my own in, in a sense. So that's the really fun part for film. And, uh, you know, I've had, uh, I had a, an, a meeting with producers about one of my movies that they, uh, they want to shoot. And so we're, we're talking at the moment and developing that script and, uh, it's just going to keep going from there. And I just really enjoy it. And then, but, you know, so in, in the end, it was like a, it was like a necessity to like have to do it myself, which is a pain in the ass, but it's also the best thing that happened to me because that that's what pushed me into writing and I, I absolutely love writing and I have a, a new appreciation for films, especially good films with good writing, which is very, uh, very few. I was about to say that. So what what has happened to films now, obviously? Like I watched, um, oh, what's it called? Fucking Salt Brown the other day. Have you watched that yet? Have you watched that? It's no, the fucking watched- weirdest thing I've ever watched, right? But the actual story... It's the first time in ages that a story's kept my attention without any like special effects and all that bollocks. It was so sick. It was bits of it. I'm like, fuck it out. Cursey should have warned me. But um, at the same time, it's the first time like an actual story's like kept my attention for two hours. I don't mm-hmm. know if it's because I'm so fucking addicted to Instagram and it's like 30 second reels or whatever. But unless it was like, unless it was a Marvel, unless it was a Marvel film or something like that, where I was like, I was in. There's mm-hmm. not there's yeah. not much new stuff that comes out that I'm like that interested in story wise. How do you find that like being the other side of that? I mean, it's terrible. I, I feel like this is the worst time to film in the history of film. Uh, I, I think the problem is is what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to create so much diversity, which means that you're you're starting to cast people, writers, actors, directors based on their ethnicity and not on their skill set, which means you're going to get far worse things you're going to get stories that less people are interested in you're going to get people bringing those stories to life that are not very good at what they're doing not very good writers not very good directors not very good actors uh so you're going to water down the quality of things um and you're going to limit the amount of stuff that people have grown to love and people that you know the stories that we all we all love of like you know masculine men doing masculine things that i i grew up in the 80s watching that shit it made me feel good it made me want to be a fucking man now like to be a man is such a bad thing and if you are a, a white man you're an idiot and you're evil and all this kind of stuff it's just so 
it's so off-putting and I, I'm so mm. sick of seeing it. I'm not alone. There's like most people are so sick of seeing it, but people are scared because they're worried about getting cancelled. I ain't scared because no one can cancel me. I'm going to do my own shit. Like I, I don't give a fuck. I'm never going to like uh, – I'm never going to pander to the to the power of corporations, and uh, because I'm always going to do it myself, and I'm always going to take the power back. So, I, and I want to lead by example with like actually saying what we feel and what we think. And uh, I know I'm not a racist person, I'm not a sexist, I'm not anything like that. You know, uh, people can sit there and label because I say I don't like woke shit, and they're like, "Yeah, he's fucking whatever it is." I don't care. Um, Anyone that knows me knows that I'm not like that. I just want the best person for the job getting the job. That's all I want. And I want good stories told that people want to watch. And look, there's going to be movies and stories that are being told that it's not for me. That's fine. Like, you know, it's for other people or whatever. But like what we're seeing right now is just such an influx of just bullshit and just stupid writing, stupid characters, stupid casting, stupid fucking scripts. Uh, you know, with Saltburn, the thing I liked about Saltburn, I thought it was very good, uh, mostly very good writing, very good acting, very good cinematography, very good music. What I think it lacked is I, I think it, it, for me it was more like a Ferrari with a, a Corolla engine. So I felt like it had a um, – everything looked amazing. Didn't I didn't love the story. I didn't think the story was very compelling. I thought it was an, like the acting and all that was enough and like the – I think there was too many scenes that were put in there for just shock value for marketing. Like the, yeah, was, yeah. If, if anyone wants to watch this movie, block your ears for the next 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Licking the bathtub and all that kind of stuff and the grave scene and all that. To me, that's just too much. It's just like, it's just, it like, was, it was, I wasn't ready for it, mate. Yeah, I was like, what the it fuck is going on here? Forward. It doesn't push the story anywhere further forward. It doesn't, you know, and like the story in itself and what, what's going on, which I won't say, uh, you know, to me, it's this is nothing absolutely. Uh, you know, I feel like it was like a uh, a Walmart version of Parasite. If you've seen that movie, I haven't watched Parasite. Watch Parasite. I think it does what that was trying to do in a much classier way. Um, but it was still very good. Don't get me wrong. Compared to what everything else, so no, that's what I meant. It was the first film in ages that I just watched, and I was just. Yeah, it wasn't like it's never going to be the best movie ever, but it was just something where it was an actual story driven fucking movie that I was enjoying. You know, and yeah. I, uh, it's been a fucking while since I've actually even liked. The other thing I didn't love about it was I felt like it was a female writing men, writing males, which I felt like they were very effeminate men, all of them. Oh yeah, they were very they were very poncy, mate, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, uh, which is fine. Like one or two of them, I get. But the whole cast was was pretty much like that, <laughs> uh, and yeah. I and I just didn't feel like it justified the the coolness of the the other character that I think is Australian or English character, the tall guy, the tall handsome guy. Yeah, like the cool character to me, it's like he it didn't seem that cool. Like there's no reason for him to be that cool. He's like he's a nice guy, handsome guy, but like give me some really give me some reason for him to be so desirable that you would end up doing the things that he did because of that guy. But I don't know if you've seen the Iron Claw. Have you seen that? No, I've not watched that now. Watch that movie because that I feel like that was one of the better movies I've seen in a long time, and I, and I feel like it was like a movie about men written by men that really understood masculinity, but also under, understood the downside of masculinity and the battles that we have to go through mentally. It's a really dark story, um, but really like really well done. So I, I think that was my favorite movie I've watched in the last couple months. Iron Claw with um. Who's in Iron Claw? Uh, it's a couple of good, really good actors. All of them are actually really good actors. Um, yeah, and there's certain things like anything that I didn't love in it, but uh, I think that that hit the spot a lot more than even um, Saltburn. Mm. Yeah. yeah, for me, I think there's definitely a hunger for that for that sort of film. I think that pendulum's got to swim back at some point, right? And it, it seems like that, you know, it it feels like there's probably about five ten percent of the population that have. They have this agenda, but they're just very loud about it. Yeah. I think people will push back. I think over over the next few years, you can feel it already. Yeah. People are like enough to fuck enough in it. Like people like us, where again, like you said earlier, we're not racist. We're not anything. It's just, it's going so far the other way that if you are a straight white man, you're getting way less opportunities. You cannot say anything against anyone else. You cannot even have your own opinion about anything because else you are called a right wing extremist. You are called so many different things just for having any sort of political view or any sort of fucking 
well, anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. But I think, yeah, I think by the sounds of it, mate, you're going to be making some good content, some good films. So can't wait to see it. Thank you. What sort of genre are you going for, mate? Is it horror or is it uh, something else? Um, for me, I, I use like the analogy for jiu-jitsu. It's like, would you want to practice kimuras all day or do a bit of everything? For me, I like mm. doing a bit of everything. So I don't think so much in genre. It's more like what story do I want to tell and uh, whatever that sits in, that's the world I'll sort of play it in. And, and I kind of like to have it a little bit of everything in, in my scripts. I like to have a little bit of a little bit of horror, a little bit of comedy, a little bit of action, a little bit of drama. Uh, and and uh, so, so it's really hard to sort of sell it. For example, the three scripts I've written, the first one's a pilot for a series and it's a, um, it's a dark comedy or dramedy. So it's a good drama comedy, but it's dark. The second one is a an action horror, okay? The third one is uh, a drama or a thriller, like a thriller probably. And the fourth one is action, futuristic sci-fi action. So they're all very different. Um, and I, I kind of just write the movies that I would like to see. Like I kind of I, I come up with an idea, a concept, and I'm just like, what if this? You know, it's kind of like the whole like, you know, what if you put a scorpion and a spider in a jar and you shook it up? What would happen? You know, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that I like. You know, uh, like I'm writing a – the one I'm writing right now is set in 2100. And I'm like, you know, one, what would LA be like in 2100? What would change, you know? And then I, you know – put this guy in it this you know he's a he's like the last blue collar worker in there and um he's you know working a job he's an amputee he uh can't afford to to you know to provide for his family feels like a failure decides to try and sell his uh his limbs on the black market to to be able to fund his family and you know shit just goes south you know what i mean it's like just a, <laughs> it's gonna be a wild story and there was another movie that i wanted to write that it's like what if uh what if you just woke up one day and next door there was this brand new house that was just built out of nowhere, never seen it before. And I was thinking like, and you can't get in, you can't even put a scratch on this house. It's, and there's, and I was, my idea was like, what would an alien house look like one, or what would a house a thousand years in the future coming back to our time look like, you know, and what kind of capabilities would it have? And I'm thinking like, you know, you go into this house, they finally get into this house and then the house can like, can read your thoughts and can create like every room can be of your, you know, your greatest dreams and, you know, wherever you are and it can completely change. And then what would happen is it, at first it would be like just amazing. Like you go in this room and it's like my childhood room or, you know, my dream or out, yeah, out in space because you love it, whatever it is. And then it, your, you know, your darker repressed memories, uh, suppressed memories start coming in and like certain things start leaking in and then, you know, realize the house is kind of evil kind of thing. And uh, just weird shit like that. Like I like that kind of stuff. And I, I try and write a, most of my movies, I try and write in a way that kind of takes you on a story. You don't know exactly where you're going. You have an idea, but I'm going to take you through some twists and turns and then have you not not expecting the last part but being satisfied with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, mean, I can't wait to see this stuff because most, when I think about you as an actor, most of it are just comedy sketches around jujitsu. <laughs> so I'd be, uh, I'm, I'd, yeah, I'd be very fascinated to see how you, uh, how you're performing some of those other scenarios or those other scenes. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that. No, I'm, I'm super excited for it. I'm really, uh, you know... It- I never, I never really thought that I really enjoy it so much. And it's so funny because like comedy comes easy to me, but honestly, like drama is where I think really good films and, and acting lies. Like I, 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 it's lovely to see a comedy, don't get me wrong. And it's nice, but they don't touch you and, and hit you as well as what a drama, a drama, you know, really well done drama can. And that's what I, what I strive for is, is to have, you know, movies that are really impactful and not in a way like like i'm a philanthropist or anything like that in an entertain in an entertaining way you know i'm not here mm-hmm. trying to tell you know tell people how to live their lives and uh, you know trying to get people to become vegan or some shit through my films i'm just like here like i want to take you on a journey and and take you away from you know the troubles that we have in the world for a while so you forget about all that shit and uh and leave feeling satisfied yeah yeah, I love that, mate. While we're on the topic, I need to ask, what is your favourite film of all time? Fucking ask a question. <laughs> or, or, or top or top three. I always say, okay, Lord of the Rings is probably my favourite movie of all time, like the, the, the whole trilogy. And uh, yeah. I never would have thought, I, I remember watching that as a kid, I was, I was looking for a movie to watch at the theatre with my friend and we couldn't find one. 
And I was like, Lord of the Rings, what the fuck is this shit? And I'm like, okay, let's go watch this. And and as soon as it started, I was just like, oh, this is amazing. This is everything I love in a film. And, um, and then it got to the end and I'm like, what the hell? It didn't finish. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't know it was a three-part movie. Mate, I did the exact same thing. I was fucking fuming, mate, when that film ended. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I absolutely loved it. I, I It was like one of the I, – I, I was obsessed with it. Uh, you know, it's ho- all the lore about it and stuff like that as well. Uh, so I always tell people that's my favorite uh, you know, film because I just really enjoyed it a lot. And I, I think that the J.R. Tolkien was so good with the writing, with the characters, and I think Peter Jackson did such a good job of bringing that to life with Viggo Mortensen as, you know, Aragon and, uh, you know, I think it was some amazing actors, Christopher Lee and Sir, uh, what's who played uh, Gandalf? What's his name? Oh, I forget his name. Ian, Ian, Sir fuck it it doesn't matter but uh yeah it was really good and i would say like my favorite horror is the exorcist um and one of my favorite movies i I think one it's terrifying too i think it's got some of the best writing and acting i've ever seen in a horror movie and uh you know the characters are just all so good they're so three-dimensional you have like you know the young priest that's a uh he's a pre he's a psych he's a clinical psychologist and a priest and he's lost faith in god and he's he's living with the guilt of his mother passing away recently, and uh, you know he's also like he's a trained boxer as well. It's like such a cool like character, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? And then you have the mother that like super famous, rich, has all the money in the world, but has no power to save whatever the hell is happening to her daughter that they're taking to all the best, you know, all the best psychologists, all the best doctors in the world, and nobody knows what to do. And then they, you know, they have to uh, bring this priest in to see if there is a, you know, what's going on. He doesn't even want to come in there. And he's like, you know, some of the lines in there, she's like, you know, what about possession? He's like, yeah, if you lived in the 18th century before, you know, we figured all this stuff. Out. And uh, it's, it's, it's just really good. You know, he approaches it as, as a scientist, as a, uh, you know, a psychologist and not as like this, you know, then I just give into it to demon straight away. And it, it's just, it's, 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 it's really phenomenal. The acting from the girl, the acting from the, the mother, the priest, the older priest, priest, um, the, the Swedish one, I forget his name, was so good. Uh, a lot of the, you know, even the detective that comes in, they have this detec- detective character that's coming in trying to figure out what's going on. And I, I just think it was phenomenal. The only thing that I didn't love in it was probably the, uh, the sound design is a little bit rough but it's still really good because of what it is. And just the cuts, the cuts are so like harsh, but that's the way movies were back then. So mm. I think that's my best horror. Um, last one, third one. The last one. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I think like, I'm just going to throw one out there and I would say like Terminator 2 was mm. really fucking classic. Yeah, that would be my top three. Uh, between I that and Jurassic Park, I think. Mm. So like those two are just like two – one Terminator Two was just such a. It's so hard to nail a sequel, and he did it, you know, and changed so many different things. And I think it was phenomenal. Uh, Jurassic Park structurally is probably the best structured film of all time. If you if you go in and look at how it is, like you have the the perfect hook with the the Velociraptor being pulled in at the start, not knowing what it is, not seeing what it is, but like all the tension and what's going on, and then suddenly there's this, you know introduces the main characters that are paleontologists i think they are um and you know what's his name comes and meets them that's funding their trip and says like come on i've got these dinosaurs going down and then you've got like the fucking the perfect combination of people with like characters with the the uh the lawyer that's coming down there to 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 make sure that the family is compensated and if there's any problems he's going to shut the whole thing down he's the one that gets excited about it the most about how much money he's going to make he's got that one line where everyone's against uh hammond and he's like he's like i brought you guys in to you know help me and the only one that's on my side it's a blood sucking lawyer (laughs) 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 so i think it's just yeah those two are two of my favorite movies i think i can go back and watch them all the time and they they still yeah what's yours um, I think Fight Club's probably one there for me. Yeah. I was a massive fan of Fight Club when it came out. Um, possibly Lord of the Rings as well. And then potentially Avatar. I loved Avatar too. Yeah. So so that was like the first 3D film that I watched in the cinema. Um, other than the old, like when you used to have like the red and green goggles. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think 
when Avatar came out, I was I was sort of uh, I was single, I think, and dating, and I went on on. I think I took five, no, four separate girls on a date to watch Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> on the same day? <laughs> no, sadly not. But uh, yeah, I was I was back there about four times over about a month. Fuck it, oh. I, I love that movie. That's actually one of my favorites. But I didn't love the yeah, second Avatar one. Was good. I thought the second one was just a repackaged version of the first yeah, one. Yeah, the second one was awful. Yeah, terrible. No, I, I thought it was fucking shit. My friends are working on it right now. So uh, one of my best friends, Steve Brown, is one of the best uh, stunt guys and uh, stunt coordinators, second unit directors in in the world, and he's uh, he's working on it right now on the third and fourth one. I think the third one's filmed. I think the fourth one they're working on right now. It's fucking, I don't know, I was so disappointed that second one because I was the same. I loved the first one. I watched it fucking a million times. You know what I mean? Like I loved it. And then that second one, I just didn't hit for me. Yeah, I, I think one, there's two things I think. One, I think a jungle environment is so much more enjoyable than a water environment. Yeah. Mm. There's only so much you can do with the water. Um, the second is like, it just felt like the same story. I, exactly what I was about to say, the same fucking story. I was watching it like the first fucking 50 minutes of the film is the same story. It's the same story. Yeah. And, and I think James Cameron, I think he was so, I think he was so good until he got into his philanthropist stage or, you know, where now a lot of it's more about like sending a message to save the environment. And the message was just too on the nose. Like no character is just evil. You know, there's all, and I don't think even in real life, I mean, no one's just pure evil. There's a combination of, of both in all of us. You know, there's good and bad. There's no one that's pure good. That's why Superman's boring. And I think the way he portrays men sometimes in there are just, it's so like off putting. Like, we're just like, you know, the, the humans are just so evil and the, yeah. the, you know, the, the tribes are just so pure. No tribes are pure. Tribes are savages as well. You know, they're mm. sacrificing people and shit. And I think if you had a bit of both, it would be a lot more real. Um, but I think that he's just repackaged the first one and, it, it just gets old really quickly. But I, but I just can't understand it because he had so much fucking time. It's not like as if he knocked them out one after another. He had fucking years to think about. But I think I think I think Kit's right. I think it's about the agenda. Do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's his agenda behind writing that. it, mate. I think it's changed. I just fucking yeah. hate that sort of stuff. I watched his masterclass. His masterclass is phenomenal, by the way. I, I, don't get me wrong. I think he's the one of the best directors in the world. I, I just think he's he's doing these for the wrong reason, and he, mm. he just said the same thing. As I wasn't interested in doing directing anymore. I just wanted to do. Uh, I just want to do the Avatar because I'm more interested in you know climate change and stuff like mm. that. And so, and it just for me, it just comes off so obvious. And this is the problem that most people make. I think when it comes to writing, and it's you should always write with the plot or the story uh, first, and then discover a theme through it. If you write with a theme first, let's say, and what I mean by this is like, let's say you you guys are strong vegans and you guys, I want to write a vegan film because I want to, you know, send a message. Then the whole plot, it comes off so preachy and so obvious. Mm -hmm. where a, a real good theme is where you almost don't even notice it, but you get a feeling for it, you know? And I think he did that good in the first one where it was so much more subtle that I'm like, fuck yeah, humans are kind of fucking this earth up a little bit, aren't they? You know, without really thinking it. Now it's just like, oh my God, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? So I think it's really important not to not to come in when you're approaching film. Don't approach it from a, a perspective of trying to educate people or manipulate people. And unfortunately, that's where film has gone so much lately. And it's because of people like George Soros that fund a lot of this these kind of things where they want to try and push some agenda on us. So you know they've realized that Hollywood is unbelievably. Uh, good at manipulating people and they're using it as a such a manipulation tool right now so that, that's also another reason why i think we're seeing such shitty movies and we feel like we're getting preached to the whole time and but they gotta start feeling it in the box office you look at the box office numbers now they're fucking so low yeah. because like there's a new marvel film out next week or whatever before i'd be so excited to go watch any marvel fucking shit they've got so bad and so woke and so fucking boring now i just never ever gonna go you know no. I mean? I'm never going to go. I'm just like, yeah, it, it's gone. It's gone for me. And I got fucking tattoos all over my back. <laughs> they make so much money outside of the film industry that the, those box office flops don't even affect them. They know. They're, they're, no, that's the, that's the worst thing is like we see this and we're like, yeah, look, all your movies are flopping. No one's going to watch it, getting shitty reviews, but they can keep doing it because they get so much money from elsewhere. And there's so much money from like the, the theme parks. They're about to do like a 208 billion dollar fucking upgrade to uh the theme park here disneyland here oh, it might even be more yeah 208 billion i think 
they've, they've got money, dude. They've got so much money. And that the the film industry, that's like play money for a lot of these people. And that's what, you know, that's what we kind of need to realize because a lot of them are like, you know, people are like, you know, it doesn't matter. They're having all these flops. They're gonna, it's going to stop soon. So it's not going to stop soon because they ha- this is play money from them. They have so much money. BlackRock, George Soros, all these, all these big things that own almost everything are the ones that are pushing all these different agendas and they're trying to divide us. And I, I don't want to get into political because I, I, I don't know enough about it to even feel strong about it. But uh, from what I've read, that seems to be the, the common theme here. And um, – it's just fucking up film and television so much. I think English TV and and uh, films are, are, are coming to the forefront now because I find they're a lot more real. You know, you watch yeah. something. I was watching uh, watching Kevin and Perry yesterday with my boy, and uh, I was fucking crying just with like the the house party at the start, and it just reminded me of like a house party when I was a kid. And I was like, you'd never get this in like a Hollywood film. Like it's complete. We watched American Pie actually the week before because my boys, <laughs> my boys getting right into it all. And uh, you know, in American Pie, it's like big frat houses and frat parties, and all the women are lovely. And then you switch it to like Kevin and Perry, and it's like everyone's pretty much minging shit out. So, <laughs> but a good story. Austra- Australian film used to be pretty good as well, didn't it? Like, I mean, uh, you know, go go way back. You got like, was it Romper Stomper with Russell Crowe back in the day? Yeah, Romper Stomper. Romper Stomp. Yeah, about skinheads. That just reminds me of fucking um, <laughs> South Park. South Park with one of the first episodes and the Cartman's romper stomper. Yeah. <laughs> and then I think the other one, I think this was New Zealand actually, but um, oh shit, what's it called? With Jake the Muss. What's that film called? Oh, I want some warriors. Yeah. Like, I'm some fucking eggs woman. No, I watched it yeah. recently. <laughs> I watched it recently. And I, I couldn't believe like one how bad a lot of the writing was in that film. When I went back and watched it, it was just such cheesy <laughs> writing. But, but it's a great film. Like the you know the story was great. This is the writing wasn't that the, the dialogue was pretty pretty cheesy. But uh, but that was a good. One. I watched it recently. Yeah, he's he's. So good. I think like Once Warriors, um, Animal Kingdom in Australia was really good. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my buddy, my first acting coach was in that as well. Who was that? Uh, Andy McPhee's name is. And uh, I'm really good friends with his son, uh, Cody McPhee. His son plays uh, Nightcrawler in X Men. His son was in the new Elvis. His son plays a lead in uh, a couple of different things. Uh, Power of the Dog with um, uh, fuck, what's it called? I forget his name. But uh, it was a, he was a, he was a, he won a Golden Globe as well. Yeah, he won a Golden Globe. But it was the year that they got snubbed because there wasn't enough black people in there, so they cancelled the Golden Globes, which is so sad because like what. Yeah, so he won a gold. That, that's not true. Surely they didn't. Yeah. They they cancelled yeah. it because of that. Yeah, is that actually why? Yeah, apparently. It's fucking ridiculous. I'd, I would ask anyone to Google it just to make sure, but um, that's what I was told. And uh, it was sad because, like, you know, that was going to be like a huge turning point in his career, and uh, you know, this doesn't get to reap any of the rewards because of something so stupid. That's yeah. fucking mental, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Kit, we'll, uh, we'll we'll let you go shortly, mate. I just wanted to ask a couple other bits, going all the way back to jujitsu. Mm-hmm. You said earlier that you you kind of explained to people what jujitsu is really about. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask what you meant by that, and then what you tell them. The other thing that I wanted to ask as well was just to, to get a bit of information regarding the science of learning. Mm-hmm. Um, and whether that applies to film writing or jujitsu is entirely up to you. And then I wanted to, uh, you to tell us a little bit about some of the courses you do make, because um, you got me quite excited by about uh, by what you were saying earlier in regard to, to how I can maybe accelerate my learning through problem solving. <laughs> Thank you, mate. So, what's jujitsu really about? Jujitsu is just about touching other men and just feeling loved. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think like I, I always break down jujitsu is like very simply, it's like. Jiu-Jitsu is a game of trying to force your opponent to tap through strangulation or joint manipulation. Uh, very simple. like that, That's what it really is, but it's really just like a, a gigantic uh, problem that you have to keep solving. It's like a fun Rubik's Cube that changes its colors all the time, and that's what I really like about it because there's no, you know, Nothing works every single time. Nothing works most of the time, to be honest with you. It's, and that's the fun thing about it is you have to be able to adapt really quickly and, and find new solutions to the problems at hand. Um, there's, like Honestly, if you really want the science stuff of this, I would actually go to Greg Sowers because he works so much on this kind of stuff. Uh, he, he is far more knowledgeable than me. I, I, like, I like to do things and figure things out. And uh, he likes to study things and and know exactly you know the science behind everything he's teaching. Mm. So I'd honestly, it's far better for me to to send you to him to to learn a lot more of the science behind it. 
Uh, I can give you everything else, but I just don't spend much time l- learning that kind of stuff anymore. I have like a small window of learning and I'm trying to put as much as I can in the, the filmmaking stuff of that. But a, a lot of it is just things like, you know, a lot of the things that I discovered were, were stuff like, you know, how the, how the amygdala uh, works when it comes to memory retention and things like that. So the amygdala is the part of the brain where it sends you into fight or flight. And, uh, and what it also does is it, it dictates how deep to store information in the brain. So let's say if I you're trying to get in my house and you want to know what the front door code is, I tell you it's two three five one two. You're going to remember it for probably thirteen seconds and then you'll forget it for the rest of your life, uh, unless you decide to recite it or something like a weirdo. Uh, but uh, little things like that is like your brain's telling you, okay, we don't need this for survival. It's not important, so let's um, let it go. So what it does is amygdala decides by how emotionally aroused you are. Uh, whether to store information deep or or just let it go. And the reason is, is in a dangerous situation, you're going to be emotionally aroused. So it thinks that you're in a dangerous situation. You need to get as much information as you can from this moment to uh, prevent this from happening in the future or survive it in the future so you remember a lot more. Now, if you relate that to jiu-jitsu and you're practicing a technique and drilling a technique, there's no kind of emotional arousal there. It's just boring stuff that you're just repeating over and over. So you're telling your body, okay, you're telling your brain, we need to learn this, and your brain is telling your body, we need to forget this because it's not important. Uh, but when you're live rolling or you're competing or you're, you're training under pressure, your brain doesn't know the difference between what's, you know, what's going on in, in, inside and what's really happening on the outside. So it thinks you're in some kind of dangerous uh dangerous situation so it tells you to store information far deeper so you remember that so things like if you guys have competed before it's so much easier to remember what happened in competition than what it is to what happened in training you know or you know things like that so i always try and put pressure on myself when it comes to training to make myself more emotionally aroused uh training in front of people always helps training on camera helps uh training with good people helps and um, that'll that'll help you store far more information and forget far less. So little things like that that make a, a big difference in structuring your training. So where most people would be like trying to avoid anything that seems more, uh, you know, stressful or because they want to be like clear of mind, but it doesn't really help you very much. And we use the same thing when I was teaching uh, football with my brother. And we wanted to improve the kids' uh, mechanical skills. So what he did is he, he made a rule that if they drop the ball or if they miss a target, everyone gets 10 push-ups. So what happens is people start slowing down and trying to make sure they really hit it. But then what happens in game time, you don't have that kind of luxury because you're under um, under massive amounts of pressure. So what I said, I said, let's change the rule around, Adam. I said, let's make it that if they drop a ball – or they miss a target when they're not going, you know, at a high level, like I say 100%, but never 100%, but like if they're not putting a lot of pressure on themselves, then they get 10 push-ups. So what happens, because people didn't want to drop the ball anyway, they didn't want to miss the targets, but we started like motivating them by like thinking the possibility of actually hitting a target at 100% is so much more fun. So they started putting more pressure on themselves. They started moving faster, moving harder, trying to trying to put, you know, take catches that are far more difficult. And that translated really well into game day because they started doing so much better because they felt so much more comfortable under pressure because they were trained under pressure. Rather than training them with by removing the pressure, we started training them by putting pressure on so they felt comfortability in game day and it, it made such a big difference. So little things like that is what I'm really interested in, the psychological mm. part of it. And, I, you know, we could do a whole podcast on many of these, but that's some examples of, of what I like. Um, as for the game, so what I have right now, I have many products, uh, like maybe seven products at kitdaletraining.com. And I brought out my uh, product about three, and I think 2018 called The Art of Mastering Jiu-Jitsu. And it's about my... Uh, my process to jiu-jitsu, the way I train, the way I'm thinking of different things, and it's all the concepts that I've used to connect the dots in jiu-jitsu. Instead of just techniques, it's like what I'm thinking from this area here, what I like to do, uh, and I, it's, it's like a five-hour product, I think, and I go into great depths with that. Then I brought out another product called The Art of Mastering Takedowns for Jiu-Jitsu, which is how I approach takedowns for Jiu-Jitsu and wrestling. 
um, which is w- one of my favorite products. It doesn't sell as well as the other one because a lot of people don't want to learn wrestling with, or takedowns because one, they feel like it's dangerous. Mm. But the way I teach it with my games is that I make it very safe for people so that you can develop it. And I've got people that are, you know, in their 40s and 50s starting takedowns now and absolutely love it and feel confident and safe with it because of the way we're practicing it. Uh, an example of that is like I do like entry games and stuff like that where we're not trying to take each other down. We're trying to get on a single leg or a double leg or double under and try and get people confident with getting the entries of things and then we'll start from the entries and we'll go okay we're gonna we're gonna go from here we're on a double leg we're gonna try and finish it so the 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 takedowns are not going to be very dangerous they're going to be very controlled and allow people to understand oh this is not actually as scary and bad as what you know as what it, you know people thought and you actually feel so much more confident with it but the the best seller i have right now which is doing phenomenally well especially with um with feedback is the um task-based games to rapidly improve your jiu-jitsu which i brought out i think about four or five months ago and i think we've sold close to i don't know three or four thousand uh units of that and um what that is it's i think it contains 54 games that you can play in jiu-jitsu to help you develop an understanding for jiu-jitsu so i break it down into small little games where we remove a lot of the variables and we have certain tasks and certain objectives and uh and certain restraints and i get people to play these games and they can start figuring things out themselves so instead of relying on a coach and stuff like that what you do is you start figuring out i have all the, all the teal so i have all the tools in my own head to solve these problems and just give them time where they keep playing the game over and over again so they get constant feedback for the things that are not working so it allows you to make the mistakes in an environment that you're not worried about making mistakes in that you have the you know the ability capacity to go straight back into it and solve the problem that you just made you know what i mean fix the problems you're having and you you do that for 10 or 15 minutes and you just see how much information you've gathered from just playing like that without anyone telling you what to do rather than if you were told exactly how to do it so i just break up all these games and it's not like most people think oh that's like positional sparring but no i'm i'm finding very specific areas in jiu-jitsu with very specific restraints and very specific objectives that you would never really play much time in outside of rolling that are super important that you might you know you that are so important, but you never spend any time doing it. And it, it helps so much with these little areas and these little micro areas that uh, will make you enjoy jiu-jitsu so much more and um, and get so much better at it so much quicker. Yeah, sounds amazing. I wanted to ask actually, mate, is, that, is it kind of suitable for both practitioners and coaches as well? Yeah, yeah, I get both all the time, especially yeah. like a lot of coaches because they want to coach this style or, you know, practitioners get it and they try and get it to their coaches because they want <laughs> they want the rest of the class to start doing it. So, and it, look, it's it's going, so many schools are starting to do this now. I, I think within five years, every school is going to be doing it. Uh, I said this for a long time. When I started teaching like this 10 years ago, people were like, you're crazy, you have no idea. And now so many people are doing it and they're like, okay, well, yeah, it makes sense. But I always tell people, just try it. Just try it. And I, I 100% guarantee they're going to be sold and they'll start doing it all the time. It's just so much It's so much easier way, so much a better way, so much more of an enjoyable way. And it's a way of really learning. And it doesn't really matter who they are. You know, you can get those guys that come in and uh, they just want to be told what to do. They will enjoy this far more. You just got to lead them there. Yeah, I think I'll definitely be checking out, mate. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, sounds sick. Mate, it's it's been yeah, it's been a really fun chat, mate. Been awesome. So thanks for your time, mate. Good to meet you. Likewise. And thanks for coming on. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you.